we were speaking just before, and I had told the ambassador how beautiful I think the country of Croatia is, and that we might have some people in the audience who uh, are familiar with Croatia. If any of you have lived or speak Croatian, could you please, well, we'll make you stand. So you already got a sympathetic audience there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ambassador Joska Pero is uh, the ambassador for Croatia to the United States, and he has served there since February of 2010. <clears throat> he joined the Croatian Foreign Service in January 1992, where he worked on bilateral relations with Western European countries. From 1993 to 1996, he served as deputy Deputy Chief of Mission at the Croatian Embassy in Madrid. In 1996, he was head of the Political Analysis Department and Foreign Minister Speechwriter. And from 1997 to 2002, as Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was responsible for relations with the neighboring and European countries, the United States, Russia, Canada, and Israel. An experienced negotiator, he played a prominent role in post-conflict normalization relations with neighboring countries. In 2003, he was appointed ambassador to the United Kingdom, a position which he held until 2009, when he was transferred to The Hague, where he served as a Croatian ambassador in the Kingdom of Netherlands and the Croatian permanent, res permanent representative at OPCW. He is married to Jansa Paro, a journalist for HTV, and is the father of two children. Let's all please welcome Ambassador Paro. Thank you very much. Well, I already see familiar faces uh, around, so uh, I'm obviously getting a, a, a domesticated uh, <laughs> quickly. Uh, well, it, it is uh, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, an honor uh, to participate in this program that has been organized by uh, 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 the uh, LDS Church and uh, uh, and the BYU. Uh, so far, I had a, a, a beautiful, uh, intense uh, day of yesterday, and it continues today. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Peterson has no mercy on me, uh, uh, and but I, I really enjoy uh, enjoy my, my stay and work here. So, I, uh, I'm going to talk about Croatia and uh, and the European Union. So, well. Uh, Hello, Croatians. I see. Well, uh, the national address there. That's very appropriate for the. Uh, I mean, football team national address. Uh, so, uh, a checkered nation. Uh, so, Croatia, uh, well, uh, is a country of immense uh, natural beauty and uh, immensely difficult history. Uh, I'm not going into the historic details, but suffice to say that uh, uh, to illustrate how difficult is uh, uh, the Croatian history is the story of my grandmother. Uh, she never moved actually further than from uh, the island of Pag, a little town of Pag, and eventually she moved to Zadar, to, uh, which is 60 kilometers away, uh, to join um, my mother and to live with us. Uh, she has changed five citizenship without moving uh, from one place. So she lived uh, in uh, she lived in Austria Hungary. She lived in Italy, in Yugoslavia, Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, uh, and e eventually, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, socialist uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and she died only short of joining the sixth country, and that was the Republic of Croatia. So that tells you quite a lot. So uh, a difficult history is um, uh, determined by uh, the geography. So we are a country on uh, the crossroads, crossroads of civilization, cultures, uh, crossroads of uh, invasions and uh, um, incursions of foreign powers in Europe, out of Europe. So that has provided us with uh, almost permanent instability. Uh, and that has then well determined uh, 
all the facets, good and bad, of our culture and politics. Uh, I believe that uh, joining the European Union, at least for the predictable uh, time in the future, uh, actually pr will provide and provides Croatia with the uh, uh, stability we were uh, longing for so long. So, uh, in in many ways, uh, I I dare to say that the European Union is in a way the end of. Uh, of the traumatic history for us. So the Europe, European Union is, uh, well, is a project that was devised to cope with the permanent crisis of Europe. So, uh, and, uh, well, many people criticize the, Euro the European Union as not being uh, uh, up to the challenges, well, uh, uh, stumbling from uh, crisis to crisis, uh, but the European Union again, well, is all about overcoming crisis, and uh, every crisis that we experience makes us uh, more united. Uh, every time that we stumble, the next move is not uh, shying away from uh, unification, but to make it deeper, and. Uh, so, well, the last, uh, the last uh, 20 years have seen another very important uh, um, facet of Europe, and that is the enlargement. Uh, as Europe uh, has started as a, as a project of uh, ordering, putting, putting economies in order to prevent conflicts by opening, by integrating. So, um, the enlargement is in the very nature of the project. Well, the, the very idea that started with uh, the, the coal and steel union well, uh, was growing and growing and growing until well, we have managed to incorporate national economies into one. And uh, well, to put it simply, uh, France and Germany that have, uh, uh, they, they that have dedicated have dedicated themselves to exterminate French and German people uh, for about a, a whole century. So eventually, uh, the, the the mutual penetration of of the capital, money, people uh, on both sides is such that uh, any war is actually unimaginable. So, whom you going to fight uh, fight in Germany if you are French and your money is already in Germany? Uh, so and vice versa. So Europe uh, was extending that philosophy, uh, and making national state smaller and smaller, and making the the common institutions bigger and bigger. So I, I think that we have reached uh, reached a point where uh, a little bit more is needed to end up in the United States of Europe, and I think this is inevitable. So, well, the crisis of the Eurozone uh, is, is a financial crisis, but uh, again, well, if you look at what was the, con what was the reaction on the Euro cri Eurozone crisis, uh, again, deepening of the Union, so, and it is going to continue. For us, it was critically important to belong to uh, that big, big peace project. For us, that means that we shall never again see uh, us in war. And what makes, uh, well, that philosophy, if you like, that we have uh, uh, embraced in, uh, in the long 13 years of accession uh, makes us now being the staunchest advocates of the enlargement on our neighborhood, on the countries that are not yet uh, there. So, and we are very active in that, both by advocating the enlargement in somewhat reluctant Europe, uh, enlargement in reluctant Europe, and also by investing from our own budget uh, efforts to uh, pass the knowledge, whether it is technical or political knowledge, onto our neighbors to enable them to be maybe quicker than we are 
uh, in the accession process. The ultimate goal that we have in our neighborhood is to make them live under the same roof as we live under the, under the same set of rules that, that we observe. So, and well, when that happens, the hostility of the past is going to be obsolete and absurd. And uh, I think that the things will uh, progress that way quite quickly and that before I get retired, I will enjoy the fruits of my own diplomatic efforts in that regard. Uh, I have personally been very much engaged in what uh, it was very, very important part of the accession process to the European Union, that is the process of reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation with the neighbors uh, required also the internal reconciliation. You cannot reconcile, reconcile with the others if you are not reconciled with yourself uh, on what you want to do with them. So, um, well, I would now go just uh, shortly through the technical uh, uh, details of the accession to the European Union uh, or the facts uh, related to our accession. So we were, Croatia was the first ever country to join the European Union that has uh, exit, exited uh, a war. So we are first war-involved country joining the European Union. Well, Slovenia was the first uh, former Yugoslav country to join, but they didn't have a war, so we did. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges on the way was actually to cope with, uh, cope with the legacy of war, uh, especially when it comes to uh, our internal relationship with uh, the uh, Serb minority in Croatia, and secondly, when it comes to our reconciliation capabilities uh, with our neighbors. So, um, so we have uh, started uh, our pre-accession process in the year 2000. Uh, then on the 2003, uh, after successfully uh, uh, signing and implementing the, the, the pre-accession agreement or association agreement, uh, in 2003, we have applied for the EU membership. In 2005, we have uh, started our negotiation uh, uh, process, which has ended up in, in 2012. Uh, for a year, we were a virtual member of the uh, European Union without, without right to vote, but already participating in everything. And uh, last year, 2000, in July 2013, uh, we have proudly joined the European Union as the 28 member state. So uh, that, that, that has been a great achievement. Uh, as, as I said this morning, so, uh, uh, from my own perspective, the very process of exceeding the European Union was uh, probably more important than the act of accession. So because uh, the process was uh, uh, hugely transformative. Uh, Joining the European Union is not just uh, just a matter of government. It is it is the whole society that exceeds the European Union. Uh, uh, well, <clears throat> what what is important to say is that uh, our accession uh, was evolving against the the, the backdrop of uh, uh, three big crises of the European Union. One is the financial crisis, crisis of eurozone. Uh, the other was uh, uh, the uh, mm, political institutional crisis related to it, uh, which required uh, which required uh, uh, as I have mentioned, deepening the European Union in order to cope with uh, the challenges of the financial and economic crisis. And the third one was uh, uh, the uh, Right, absorption cri crisis. So the, the question was, uh, can the European Union, with the problems uh, as, and challenges facing as the financial and economic and, uh, crisis, will absorb more countries? And uh, so, well, that the last one has produced uh, something that was called nicely as enlargement fatigue. Uh, and enlargement fatigue. Uh, well, meant for us uh, no good wind in our sails or no wind at all in our sails. 
So, uh, well, uh, new methods have, devi have been devised for Croatia that were more stringent and, and cumbersome than in the case of the almost romanticist political, uh, uh, um, political movement to, uh, to bring in the former, uh, the former uh, uh, communist countries of the Eastern Europe well, they were they were even uh, 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 well a little bit of remorse for uh, abandoning th those fantastic countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, Romania to the Soviets uh, uh, in uh, 1940, uh, 46, uh, 47. So, uh, but in Croatia, Croatian case, well, we were just uh, uh, almost entirely a technical political. Um, process so the, n there was no enthusiasm for for us and after Greece that joined alone a long time ago for geopolitical reasons uh, uh, Croatia was the first country that didn't have company so in on our on our accession process so which mean which meant actually that we we could have never uh, Hid ourselves behind the the wrong performance or bad performance of the others in the club, uh, and everything that was uh, that was bad was bad because of us, not because of the others. So we couldn't have also enjoyed the superiority of the others in the pack. We we were against again. We were alone. So there was no way to sneak under the wire. So that made us. Uh, uh, other than than uh, uh, subject to the new technology, which which introduced the uh, opening and closing benchmarks, that has made us eventually, uh, I would say, a uh, pretty perfect uh, uh, candidate uh, to join, uh, well prepared, uh, and uh, uh, well. Uh, we, we were not regretting it. it, it, it they, they were, they were period, there was a period that, we, we, that was very difficult at the beginning because uh, when uh, we started the accession talks, the European Union at the time was not ready to uh, offer a new technology. So, and that was uh, that that went created. Uh, along the way so and sometimes we felt as the goalposts are moving while we are trying to score uh, uh, that was frustrating at the beginning uh, but eventually it helped us uh, to to structure our our practices in a way in a way i must say that uh, the 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 accession process uh, uh, resembled to the autopilot on the ships so well they were uh, safe hands well uh, um, uh, at the helm, uh, when we joined the European Union, you know, all of a sudden, well, those hands were not there. Well, now we, uh, as my daughter who passed the driver test uh, last week, well, uh, <laughs> this is how we are driving now. Uh, uh, a, a bit I I insecure, uh, but still enjoying the drive. Uh, but uh, what were the, the main challenges uh, for us? I mean, for European Union, the challenge was to bring us in crazy as we are. Uh, uh, but what were the challenges for us? Uh, as I have mentioned, the legacy of war, that it was the single most uh, uh, a, a important challenge for us. A reconciliation, uh, putting the, uh, putting the uh, relationship with the neighbors in, in a good shape. But above all, uh, related to that, well, we had to pay, face uh, uh, the rule of law against uh, the romanticist perception uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to the war times. So, well, uh, as you might know, well, uh, certainly those who are uh, related to Croatia know that we had we had uh, uh, three of the Croatian generals indicted formally for the crimes against humanity in uh, the uh, by the Hague Tribunal, International Criminal Court. Uh, that was, well, that was confusing because the people asked themselves, how is it possible that the people who were defending the country from an external aggression now can be accused for the crimes against humanity? So it took time 
uh, to the leadership above all to understand that you can defend your country and still commit crimes against humanity. So these are two different things. So you can defend your country in a lawful way and in an unlawful way. So nevertheless, well, uh, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, all those three were acquitted of all charges, well, uh, we had to learn we had to learn that the shoemaker and a general are equal before the law. That is very, very important. Yeah. And, and I think we, we, we did learn that. Um, but nevertheless, well, it took a lot of energy, political energy, uh, uh, in order to move forward on the, uh, uh, because that was a part of the uh, fundamental conditionality for us to join. The second uh, big uh, a challenge which is still uh, still present is the challenge of establishing an efficient system of the rule of law after 60 years of communism you can imagine that well uh, the the legal system was not in very good shape uh, nor the understanding of the fundamental rights so this uh, had to be mm, improved uh, this is still uh, a bit of challenge, although we have uh, made uh, all reforms needed to make the judiciary more efficient. Uh, I think that the biggest progress is, is, under, is in understanding what is really a rule of law, and that there uh, we are pretty good. Uh, they, the, the, the last biggest uh, uh, challenge the, the, uh, was actually to increase the competitiveness of our, of our economy. That was, uh, uh, well, uh, you can imagine, well, uh, in, in the communist-run uh, uh, countries, well, uh, the role of government is uh, absolute, uh, and uh, many industries were continuing on, uh, living on, on the dependence on the government subsidies, uh, most notably uh, the steel uh, uh, industry and the shipyards. They, they have just... Uh, living used to get hefty between 7 to 13 percent of the final price of their products subsidized by the government or if you like by my poor pensionist mother so uh, and the question was uh, first of all the European Union prohibits that kind of uh, uh, undermining competitiveness uh, and secondly the question is why uh, my mother has to pay poor managing practices of those shipyards and steel mills from her pocket. So, well, there is no, no, no need for that. But on the other hand, that wasn't an easy thing to, to restructure them uh, because, well, those, especially shipbuilding, was a glorious tradition of, of the Mediterranean Croatia. So we used to be one of the leading shipbuilding nations in the world small but important so also well those people uh, those shipyards where uh, we're uh, giving employment to uh, between uh, uh, well di direct employment of uh, 15,000 people and about 50,000 uh, subcontractors uh, in the country so what we are going to do that do with them so you should restructure them privatize them them or close them down something of that you have to do. Well, eventually that was a big struggle because uh, of course you have social partners like uh, trade unions, workers union, they, they are conservative, extremely conservative. They they want to live on and on with the, the, the entitlements they have uh, achieved in the, in the long history. So that, that was a big struggle. Eventually we have managed to uh, let one, one of the shipyards go bankrupt uh, and uh, uh, four others to restructure, uh, 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 or, or three others restructure and one privatize. Uh, let's hope that it will uh, survive all those moves. But for the time being, they are, they are doing relatively well. So, but, so well, these were the, the biggest challenges. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, what uh, uh, remains uh, a big challenge, and if you like, uh, 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 at present a negative consequence of joining the European Union is 
uh, it stems from the fact that there is a number of companies that have failed to adjust themselves to the greater competitiveness of the uh, European Union. And they are fetching very badly. And uh, so, well, th that is the main reason that we have an uh, uh, unhealthy increase in unemployment in Croatia. Because still, they, 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 they cannot compete. Uh, some of them uh, are now trying to restructure themselves and uh, change the practices. Uh, some are going uh, uh, into the privatization lot. Uh, but, well, the companies that were uh, awakened enough uh, during the process, they have prepared themselves for the uh, increased competitiveness, uh, and they are doing really very well. European Union is good for them. Um, so, uh, we have been affected adversely uh, by uh, the crisis in the Eurozone ourselves because uh, most of our exports and uh, investments uh, come from the Eurozone countries. And when they are doing bad, we are doing bad. So it's an uh, interconnected vessel effect. So thanks God, well, uh, uh, the Eurozone is, uh, is uh, recovering and uh, they are, they are um, humble, modest uh, signs that the Croatian economy is also uh, recovering. So um, I'm confident that, uh, that, uh, um, that we shall never regret for joining the European Union. I have, uh, I have forgot to, to mention uh, five years ago, uh, Croatia has joined NATO, uh, which has made us uh, an ally, a partner of the United States uh, that has cemented uh, otherwise very, very important and very good, strategically good relationship that we had with the United States that uh, uh, along the 25 years of uh, Croatian modern statehood has played a role of the most important European ally uh, uh, in, in the world. So uh, to us, well, I know that it sounds a little bit odd, uh, United States as the most important European ally, but that is a simple truth. So uh, no country has contributed so much and so uh, in a so focused and dedicated way to our European accession as the United States of America. I mean, both politically, technically, and if you like, with your money, uh, uh, for which I think we should remain uh, grateful forever. Uh, at present, uh, Croatia is a, a staunch Atlanticist country. I don't know whether that will change or not. In the history, everything is possible. And partnership and alliances are n never forever in, in politics. But uh, uh, as, as a moralist in foreign affairs, well, uh, uh, I, I'm cer I certainly stand for the long-lasting uh, uh, close uh, partnership. So thank you. That's so much for me. I, I'm very happy to entertain any kind of questions related to Croatia and unrelated. <laughs> we do have time for questions. I will ask, though, if you're going to ask a question, if you could come up and speak on this microphone. It's kind of like a court, I guess. You're all the way on that side. But we are recording this, and we want to be able to get your question as well as the ambassador's answer. Thank you for a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I had uh, a question about, uh, you were talking about challenges of accession to, to the European Union. And one of the things that interests me is sort of the tension uh, that uh, can exist between uh, traditional sort of national identities and, and the attempt to create a larger sort of a European identity. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, uh, particularly when there are economic or political factors that, that get mixed in, uh, it seems that they're uh, at, at the same time that Europe is sort of trying to create a sense of Europeanness uh, among both older and newer uh, European countries, that there are very strong sort of local and regional uh, and national um, 
uh, identities at, well, uh, at play as well. And so, so I'm just curious uh, how that uh, is playing out uh, in Croatia, to what degree, uh, and how uh, is uh, the Croatian government uh, and, and Europe sort of trying to create a sense of Europeanness among Croatians uh, now that you've acceded to the European Union? Uh, thank you very much. This is an incredibly complex question. Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, uh, they, they, they were people who were asking uh, uh, us, uh, so uh, why do you do that? Well, you have just gained your independence. Only, only a couple of years back, well, uh, with, uh, with uh, so many sacrifices. So why you are now relinquishing uh, those uh, uh, sovereign prerogatives, uh, uh, passing it on to bureaucratic bodies of Brussels. So, and um, uh, I, I have a universal uh, answer is that uh, everyone can ask any uh, married couple, why you have given up your independence, uh, your sovereignty for a marriage? Uh, so, why? Because it's better uh, when you are together. So it's very simple as that. Well, uh, uh, you always relinquish some of your uh, selfish national interest, if you like, when you get into a marriage. So I don't think that Croatia has has abandoned its its uh, independence. We have just, uh, uh, in an orderly way, transfer. Uh, uh, some facets of our uh, 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 sovereign uh, prerogatives onto the joint uh, bodies of the European Union. Of course, you can always question uh, how representative those bodies are indeed. Are they uh, enough representative? But this is a, an ongoing discussion in the European Union. But. Uh, uh, what you do not need to abandon is your cultural identity. On the contrary, European Union is putting a lot of money uh, into ma the maintenance of the cultural identity. Uh, it, it is the union of diversities. This is how, how we see ourselves. I mean, the national histories of, uh, of the individual member states of the European Union are so deep that even when uh, one day we create a joint European identity, uh, that is going to remain part of that identity. Well, Croatia, on the other hand, well, uh, uh, some uh, among you would know that the traditional historical name of Croatia was a triune kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, and Dalmatia. So, uh, and uh, we do not, ourselves, we do not have a very uh, uh, unique identity. So Dalmatians are all, will always remain Dalmatians, and Slavonians will always remain Slavonians, and so on, Istrians, Istrians. And, but still, we are Croatians all together, and, uh, and very proud of that. Uh, so I don't see that as a problem. When it comes to the uh, uh, tension between the national uh, economies and the global economy, because this is about it, because Europe European Union is, is a project of uh, an orderly globalization from uh, a regional globalization. So I, I think, uh, 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 I th I'm, I'm deeply convinced that, uh, that un unless you make your n national economy global, exposed to the winds of globalization, you are going to wilt and will, will not thrive. So, uh, we should learn how to uh, act locally, uh, but think globally. So, uh, I think that this is the future. Well, the present the present crisis has seen uh, contractions and inward-looking tendencies. Uh, there are some uh, some people, theoreticians that that claim that we are now witnessing deglobalization, deglobalization process. If it is so, well, it's not going to last more for, than for maybe a decade. Uh, it, it's inevitable. I mean, the uh, world is getting smaller. Uh, you cannot make your uh, economies recluse. Uh, and, well, the future of, na of the national states is in identity, cultural identity, but not in political identity. I think that the national state uh, as something that has been created relatively relatively recently 
as everything that has been created uh, will disappear so, and something else would come up uh, so uh, I don't want to go too too far into the future but I, I think I think that this is not a real a real problem this is a pro problem that is uh, uh, exacerbated by the issue about by the phenomenon of immigration uh, and that might uh, might uh, a set a setback uh, in uh, in in Europe and elsewhere in the United States too uh, but let's think about uh, the, 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 the simple fact that all the countries in the world are consequence to uh, emigration. All the countries. So we have all arrived from uh, somewhere and we are all going to somewhere. So and take the, the example of the United States. I mean, it's a little bit pathetic to, to well, uh, dramatize about the immigration because everyone is immigrant in this country, except for for the Native American Indians, and they are also immigrants, as we have learned uh, uh, from Asia. So the world is about uh, moving around. So, um, well, some people some people uh, in Croatia are moaning about this. Croatians are, will disappear. We are small, and we are disappear. And then, well, if you look into any room where you have more than 10 Croatians, then you will realize that uh, at least half of them have arrived maybe three or four generations ago from somewhere. So my family arrived from uh, Italy. My wife's family came from Poland and Hungary to Croatia. Uh, my son is working in London. And I doubt that he's going to go to Croatia unless the company in London sends him to work there. So is that a tragedy? It's not. Because already, well, uh, we have influx of immigrants coming to Croatia in search for a better life. And they are going tomorrow to be good Croatians. So there is no tragic in that. That's a constant movement. Sorry for uh, a long uh, response. Any other? Yeah. Thank you for coming, Mr. Ambassador. Um, your argument about um, avoiding future wars um, by joining the European Union is based around the idea of um, economic integration. And with greater economic integration comes a, a less willingness to, to participate in aggression against one another. Um, I hope the implications of my question are not true. Um, I, I want to believe that, but I, I just wanted to push you on something and, and just see what you would, how would you respond. Um, many of, of some of the most violent wars, um, particularly in the 20th century, have been uh, between countries that were um, economically integrated. And um, I could see maybe a scenario that plays out um, let's say between Germany and Greece, all those nasty Greeks, they don't pay their fair share and, and the Germans get upset mm -hmm. about that and then the Greeks say, well, you're not upholding your contract, you have to help us and they get upset about that and tensions start to rise. Could the European Union actually form a European disunion and start further aggression? What are your comments and thoughts about that? Well, my comments are that everything is possible in, in the human society. So, uh, but I don't envisage, uh, well, Greek, Greece and Germany are certainly not, not a good example because uh, uh, there is such a disbalance in powers that, uh, that, that is not, a, not Im imaginable. Uh, but, uh, well, you should understand Germans who are working hard and then seeing their, their money going to uh, Greece where uh, they are not working hard but spending hard, hard uh, that money. So, well, and then the Germans are unhappy for that. And then the Greeks are unhappy because uh, the Germans uh, were forcing them to austerity that they are not used to. Uh, and they do not think that is just. And by the way, I mean, uh, both sides are right. 
German citizens are right. Well, we don't know. Uh, we don't want uh, politicians to give away our money. Uh, and the Greeks are right. Well, they, uh, why are they forcing us? Because we are innocent in that. Well, uh, well, the bad luck for the Greeks, they had corrupt and inefficient governments. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, then, on the other hand, uh, for uh, all the uh, all the resistance of the citizens of Germany and other well-off countries in Europe in giving away, everyone is giving away. Uh, and why is it so? Because, well, we cannot survive uh, being overly rich. Germans cannot survive uh, uh, budget surpluses. Who is going to buy, uh, who is going to buy uh, German product if everyone else is poor? So th it is not just a, 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 a charity for which the Germans are financing, uh, uh, financing less fortunate uh, member states. It's pragmat. It's a, it's a pragma. Uh, well, the Germans, they, they want the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Croatians to, uh, to uh, fetch better than they do because then they are going to buy German goods. So, and we, of course, we like to see ourselves uh, 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 better well off uh, to buy German goods too. So uh, everyone likes the idea of us driving around in Mercedes, but uh, it's not an easy thing to, to uh, uh, gain that money. So I, I'm not worried about that. Uh, on the contrary, so I, I think that the more independence, uh, the better. Yeah, as we can see, for example, with Russia and Ukraine, well, how far the Russians will go as far as they realize that they are going to lose money. Uh, uh, how far we are going to go against Russia as far as, as we realize that we will lose money. So again, well, we have, uh, we have so much money in Russia. Russians have so much dependence on our money. So I, I don't believe in a, in a new Cold War in that regard. So I think this project, uh, this project of opening up uh, creating more uh, competitive environment is good. I hope only that uh, the United States and the European Union are going to reach an agreement very soon on uh, the uh, transatlantic uh, partnership and uh, investment uh, agreement, uh, which will uh, uh, interconnect our economies uh, even stronger than they are now. So uh, that would be a good thing to see. Uh, but. Of course, well, we're going to see resistance to that, well, on both sides, yeah, but it's inevitable too. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Go around, go around here. You, you ask the question here. Oh, great, thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming. Uh, it seems like you focused a lot uh, in your comments about the economy on structural changes inside Croatia. Um, I was just wondering, what, what assistance would you like to see from the international community, if any? Oh. Well, uh, uh, I, I think that the question, the question uh, should be posed to the Croatian government rather than, than to the international community. I, I don't think that community, the international community is keen to help, nor it will help. Uh, what we have to do is to create uh, a positive investment atmosphere in Croatia and to make Croatia uh, attractive for the direct foreign investments. Uh, and that is our job. No one can help us. Uh, our politicians know perfectly well what has to be done. The question is why are they not doing it? Uh, uh, and the question, uh, the answer is uh, of course known to everyone. Uh, so that, that would in many cases uh, require uh, rather difficult uh, um, and painful structural reforms uh, of social policies, for example, uh, which means uh, uh, government expenditure uh, should be re redirected to from uh, the socialist practices of uh, crazy entitlements in 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 everything, free of charge education for all, uh, 
uh, free of charge medical care for all. So uh, everything is free in Croatia, and you have uh, you have a situation where uh, two people are working for one retired person. So this is insane. So it could not go on and and on and on, uh, just in order to to uh, gain votes. So something has to be done. Someone has to finally sacrifice a little bit of, uh, of uh, the easygoing uh, uh, political gains. The other thing that has to be done in Croatia, uh, which is also facing the, 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 the heritage of communism, is to get rid of the government's property in the real economic sector. So in, according to the World Bank uh, uh, data, uh, 59% of the Croatian GDP is generated from the companies owed by the government. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. So just for comparison, in Estonia, uh, that percentage is below 1%. And then we'll ask the question, why Estonia, after they had a terrible uh, drop of almost 15% uh, of negative growth, now have 7% of positive growth, and Croatia is still lingering in, in 0 0.5 of growth, which is hardly, uh, we can hardly call that growth. So it is because, uh, it is because the, the political, uh, I would say, trading of influences. Uh, so well, uh, the, the management of so many companies in Croatia is basically appointed by the government and the parties. Uh, so uh, this is, this is the, the, the core reason for corruptive practices. It's not about, well, uh, channeling, funneling money into politicians' uh, pockets, but, well, it is about uh, trafficking in influences. Well, uh, well, that was a very popular term when I served in Spain, uh, trafico de influencias. Uh, uh, trafficking, trading influences. So, it, well, what, what happens actually that you have the management under your political control, they are going to get subcontracts to the private sector who eventually is going to donate to the party. Uh, and this is a vicious circle that serves no purpose. And uh, uh, the good thing about uh, the European Union is uh, that the high level of competitiveness is forcing those miserable uh, Managements that uh, that have a political background rather than uh, a, a real competitive background to restructure the companies if they know, or to sell them if they don't know, and eventually, I think uh, due to the crisis and to the competitive framework of the European Union, uh, my uh, my prediction is that the number of 59 is going to drop in two years probably somewhere on 20, between 20 and 25. And this is good for us. So these are the structural reforms. So. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. Yeah.